आप बताइए जब इंटरनेशनल रिसर्च डिविशन इंडिया इंटरनेशनल सेंटर एंड प्राइम बुक्स टूगेदर so um, as the title suggests the book offers very rich insights on the diversity of languages in the asian region many of which have survived perhaps a couple of thousands of years many of them including oral and unwritten ones endangered in the present century with the possibility of facing extinction in this context this volume is a compilation of papers on the topic presented as a seminar held at the india international center in 2016 which was chaired by the late dr kapila vatsyayan chairperson of the iic international research division at that time well kapila ji needs no introduction uh, she apart from her contribution to the arts cultures and education she has been a great promoter of language diversity and has pioneered the cause of revitalization of endangered languages in international forums such as unesco this seminar was coordinated by professor anvita abdi and the book is edited by her jointly with dr vatsyayan professor abdi is a well known linguist and language historian who has done extraordinary amounts of work in the area of social linguistics her work on languages of some of the lesser known areas in asia identification of great andamanese the sixth family of india and ongoing work on nicobar islands are nothing but uh, nothing short of fascinating uh, she has taught at jnu and in universities across europe australia canada and the us and has received several awards including the padma shri from the government of india coming to the book itself there are more than 20 essays in this volume with topics as diverse as the spread of languages across asia and the current situation which threatens diversity the impact of modern education with this privileging of one language and for the consequent result of language dis- dis- uh, discrimination stamping the status of minority marginalization and depletion the impact of globalization and other similar crucial questions as professor abhi had remarked in her introduction south asia has most of the world's languages sustained over thousands of years however there are brave and vital efforts to save the situation across the region of, of at the societal level and also from the side of the state to resuscitate these languages across asia which are which are all many of them are documented in this book some good steps in the, in the direction as i was reading the book i saw from pakistan from bangladesh indonesia in bali thailand then many many case studies from myanmar vietnam sri lanka in a nutshell all over asia from india there are several papers discussing issues such as the dominance of hindi and marginalization of other languages the role of women in maintaining language from orissa chatisgarh many case studies point out to longer term goals such as community organization documentation education and shift in national policy in this context the people's linguistic survey of india steered by professor ganesh devi is a significant effort in india's case we are aware how the use of english as a medium of instruction and neglect of regional and indigenous languages have eroded much of our culture and history as it is often said how a library <clears throat> perishes when a person dies when a language dies a whole culture becomes extinct and with it a whole civilization never to be retrieved again so uh, i now introduce the panelists again each of them has specialized experience and may not need a very detailed introduction 
Professor Aisha Kidwai, teaches at JNU. Her work has earned recognition for relating the general theoretical framework of universal grammar to the particular syntactic features of Indian languages, analyzing them within the structures of cognitive systems and their general properties. She has also worked on the politics of language, translation, and partition studies. Professor Sukrita Paul Kumar, still recently held the Aruna SFL chair at the University of Delhi. She has held many positions, including fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in Shimla, poet in residence at Hong Kong Baptist University, and she has published many, many, several critical works on partition, modernism, and gender, and is also a noted poet. Professor Imtihar Sasnin is professor at Aligarh Muslim University and has published extensively in social linguistics, minority language rights, and critical discourse analysis. He also has extensive research and academic experience with national and international institutions, and is currently working on a multi-institutional and multidisciplinary project titled Linguistic Activation and Bidirectional Reading specific to Urdu, in special relation to Urdu. With this, now I open the floor to the panelists, and I'm sure that we are going to have a very, very lively discussion. As moderator, I have to remind you that since the allotted time is 60 minutes, each of you could talk for about eight minutes, and uh, so that we can also take some questions at the end of all of that. And as for those who would like to post the questions who are uh, listening in, I would like to request you to type them into the chat box, which will be brought to the notice of the panelists. I also have some personal questions, which I will pose later, but now the floor is open and I think it will be the, uh, uh, Professor Abdi will be the first person to start. Thank you. Excuse me, Sudhaji, I, I don't see Professor Imtiaz Hasnan. He is and, there. Uh, yes, I'm there, ma'am. Okay. All right. Welcome to all of you. It's so nice to see that these scholars who are real expert on linguistic diversity are with us today. And uh, this has been a very rare occasion to have such, uh, such discussions in IIC on the book, which was actually had its genesis in IIC. Dedicated to the fond memory of uh, Dr. Kapila Vatsyan, whose scholarship of cultural studies would remain unsurpassed for a long time, as would be her zeal to encourage such studies through a large number of personal and professional associates, as well as numerous institutions that she helped to create or activate or guide in pursuance and celebration of cultural and art studies. She played a pivotal role in safeguarding the legacy of classical Indian art forms in all its genres, be it performing arts or be of oral tradition. And it is in the light of this oral tradition that she thought of this international seminar to hold. To such an epitome of a persona, we dedicate this volume, a humble volume to Dr. Kapila Vatsyan. It's ironical, it's very, very ironical that she is one of the co-editors of the book as well as I'm trying to uh, dedicate the book to her because she left half the way, you know. She, she arranged the conference she, right from the, is, uh, the whole idea of the, the whole concept from the inception to the culmination, she was part of this project. She was there to host all the delegates and it, we tried to have all the eight countries of Southeast Asia. We managed to get all the countries of South Asia we also tried to manage to get all the Southeast Asian scholars, but somehow due to some restrictions by the respective governments, permissions were not granted at the right time. So some of them could not attend. However, Kapilaji was very, very close to the concept of linguistic diversity and it's the erosion of linguistic diversity. We used to talk about this, the, <clears throat> Because we, we both realize that, and I'm sure the other panelists on this panel also agree that linguistic diversity is part and parcel of the diversity of life. 
in nature and culture. And any loss in linguistic diversity is a loss in vitality and resilience, as Louisa Murphy says, of the whole web of life. In fact, the whole field of biocultural diversity today uh, it takes a shape in which it is uh, proven beyond doubt that there's an inextricable relationship between language, knowledge, and uh, environment and culture. And this is what I think the, the volume tried to, or at least the seminar tried to emote. And only the discussants can say whether we succeeded in this uh, goal or not, because we do, we do believe that bio, there's a relationship between biodiversity, cultural diversity, and linguistic diversity is inseparable. The other questions which actually bothered Dr. Kapila Vatsyan and to me also was the question of linguistic imperialism. And uh, the single language dominance, we realize that always leads to linguistic imperialism. And as, as I've written in this book that linguistic imperialism and linguistic marginalization basically are two uh, uh, faces of the same coin. This is the two aspects of the same spectrum. The, and this issue had been addressed in a number of papers in this volume. And similarly, the other question or the other issue which really troubled us was of the linguistic apartheid. And that's, does that situation has been created recently because we have ignored our unwritten languages across the Asian subcontinent. And in this respect, the South Asia and Southeast Asia share a lot of concerns because there are approximately 3,000 unwritten languages today in the Asian belt. And these languages are being eroded gradually because of the dominance of one single language. So the, the linguistic imperialism leads to linguistic apartheid also. There has been a massive language shift in several communities and that also I thought would come out in the Asian uh, uh, belt. And it has uh, many of the authors could bring this out because language shift is not merely a shift in the verbal repertoire. As we know that when there's a language shift, there's a, it's basically leads to language loss, language and loss of culture, loss of philosophy, loss, loss of worldview, and epito and plethora of other related aspects. So with these basic issues, we started this seminar and uh, we culminated in, in, a, in a session where we realized that we have very similar problems to share across the Asian continent. And perhaps the reasons for problems are also very similar. Now, the, we also discussed how this, the, the erosion has to be arrested. We also discussed how the institutions can play a role in it. Or the how, and there are, the, we, we also realized that Thailand is a very good example where there's an institutional support for, uh, for, this, uh, for these kind of uh, uh, activities. Then there are also the uh, countries like Nepal, which includes a uh, uh, large number of languages. In fact, there's no minor languages in that country. So that was one very heartening uh, conclusion that we, that we drew. The other thing was that the even uh, the, um, the other countries were clamoring for the fact that the multilingual education should be promoted, just like we want in India. So there were many similar issues, which will I'm sure will come as we discuss more and more. Let me inform the audience that the scholars for this uh, uh, discussion for the sorry for the book I should say or for the seminar were drawn from various disciplines, namely linguistics, literature, political science, education, folklore, anthropology, social science, and community knowledge. So we had a very, very wide spectrum because ultimately we all realized we believe in one key component of our, uh, uh, which is the language, which actually is the uh, reflection of shared heritage of a group or a nation or humanity at large. And language basically has a major role in fostering social cohesion. And this is very well reflected in one of the articles, which I'm sure the readers must be uh, very much enamored by, 
Sastri Sunarti, where she talks about the Lego Lego dance of Alila people in Indonesia. And this is a reflection of how oral tradition maintains social cohesion because the share of the knowledge and the sharing of the same ethos. But rather than discussing more about the book, I will, uh, uh, I will come again when there are questions and answers. So I'll pass on to the, to the moderator, Dr. Sudha Gopalakrishnan to take on from here. Thank you very succinctly. Succinctly, I think you have put all the points, uh, uh, put forth all the points. Also, it was very revealing that you know there are there are no major minor uh, uh, gradations in Thailand, and also about um, um, the, of course I read about this uh, Lego Lego dance, and it was fascinating. It was fascinating how through an oral tradition, through a dance performance, I mean this kind of cohesion, community cohesion can be brought out was very interesting. There are many questions, like you said, which will come your way. But now let me just ask, uh, I think, uh, Aisha, Professor Aisha Kidwai to take the floor, please. You're not audible right now. You're not audible, Aisha. Yeah, sorry. Um, hello, thank you very much for inviting me to be uh, part of this panel. And uh, actually very sincere congratulations to uh, Professor Anvita Abbi and the IIC for bringing out what is a very important volume at a time when um, you know, the International Decade for Indigenous Languages has just commenced from the UNESCO. Uh, I find it important when one reads a book, one um, reads it of course for the information and the knowledge that is contained uh, within it, but also what, uh, how it dovetails with one's own thinking. So it's one of these seminars where actually I'm 100% confident that we are uh, <laughs> in like-minded um, uh, people uh, amongst in like-minded company. And uh, what is very nice is to read a book where you're completely like-minded as well. So it's impossible actually to ju do justice to the very interesting uh, essays uh, in this book. Uh, so I thought I would dwell really on what my um, thinking is, because it's something that there's information as uh, Professor Abhig already said, that the book gives you about the incredibly common patterns that we have across uh, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, we have um, maybe one or two languages, usually English, um, plus, in, in India's case, 22 languages at the top. Uh, so we have a pyramid of a hierarchy where there are, there's what Namakant Agnihotri has called a multilinguality. So that's uh, India prides itself, for example, on the, the fact, or even Indonesia prides itself, that there are a couple, there are a few languages that we have accorded a certain status. Um, and then there are, there is a vast number of languages, big and small, which are make up the middle and the bottom uh, of the pyramid. And we're not even talking about variations within those languages. And this pyramid, this uh, is of concern to linguists, to social scientists, to states, uh, or perhaps states are not concerned enough, uh, is a criticism that we can make. And what the essays in this book do is um, tell you exactly what the status is. And the lens here, so if I can, if you can imagine um, yourself in a Google map. So as you zoom in, so there are essays that zoom into, uh, for example, Northern Pakistan, there are essays that um, take a national view like Bangladesh, there are essays that look at just three communities. There are essays that look at a dance. There are essays that as you zoom in further, I mean, if you zoom into map of JNU, you must be able to locate my school of languages where I'm sitting right now and you'll find. There are essays that look at the question of language vitality and language shape and really the family, the household level. And what, one thing that the essays do is show you that really as far as language vitality and language, um, especially language apartheid is concerned, that the finer you go, 
the more reasons you find for language shift. So some of the really very nice, um, um, very detailed essays uh, are the essays that look within a community, what is the attitude, um, community which is considered to be one community by the state speaking one language, uh, but actually you find that there are three communities and they have very distinct attitudes towards each other, not necessarily that um, um, they have uh, animus towards each other. And if you go down to the household level in um, article by um, uh, both Taramadasa and um, uh, in, by um, uh, Kartik Narayan, you see that the, there is difference in attitudes and therefore maintenance of language along the lines of gender. If you zoom out a little bit in the Indian state of Jharkhand, the article by Sabira Hashmi tells you that there is so this, this range. And this leads me to you know, some questions that I've been dealing with and I'm, I think I'm already using up my eight minutes, so I'll be very quick. Uh, that when we talk about language shift and language um, maintenance, and we talk about revitalization projects, the usual frame of analysis has been state policies. So we begin with constitutions and we begin with uh, the provisions there. And that's, there is a, a reasonable diversity between um, uh, in, even in South and Southeast Asia, even though we became independent around the same time, um, that there is a difference in whether minority languages are recognized or not. In India, in one sense, you have a hyper recognition of um, uh, minority languages in which it says, but that hyper recognition has just meant that it has stayed on paper. And uh, compare that to Sri Lanka where there is no uh, record of um, languages, um, uh, official recognition of minority languages in the constitution. It's one nation, one, one nation, two languages. And that second language also had some bit of fighting to be able to be recognized. And then you, um, our discourse always looks at the macro level. Unfairly to all the other speakers, and because I don't have so much time, I would like to flag out for us the Thailand and the Indonesian experiences. And certainly the Indonesian experience is perhaps most um, um, akin to ours because around some 800 languages, different language families, mostly not classified. Um, and uh, and what they, that article signals was that planning and talking about language endangerment and language diversity at this big nation state level is wrong for two reasons. One, as Professor Abhi already mentioned, that people are actually multilingual, that in their linguistic repertoires, that there exists not only one language. And this is certainly a, um, a hangover of our colonial past, where we as people were mapped onto, um, into our communities and we were mapped irrespective of our um, uh, localities and our, the multilingualness of our nation, we were mapped into, onto one language. And that legacy has led to, you know, being the unambiguous identification of a minority language because we are not considering the other languages and the way that functional load is distributed. I think this is particularly the case. So uh, the, the um, articles from Indonesia and um, uh, uh, should be a mirror to uh, Indian language learners to look at look at the way that. If you think of multilingual ecologies, if you think of languages existing from the based on the work of Bill Hausler, the very famous linguist, then if you think of languages as relating to not just one choice of a language, that you don't tie people to mother tongues, but to baskets of languages. The Lego Lego dance performance as well also tells us that plurality and harmony can be built when there is awareness and consciousness of another's language. That lesson, which is the lesson that we learn every day when we step out of our homes and we speak, you know, one language in the market and one language in the classroom, that we, that it's not languages that far. The second point that I want to make 
uh, again from the um, um, Indonesian uh, and the Thai experience is the role of linguistics that these essays make one think about, the role of linguists. So linguists have become a bit of doomsayers. We are always trotting out the figures of 7,000 languages endangered. Our job is to preserve them. But if you actually plan with the knowledge base in society, the way that you do prestige planning, the way that you revive and maintain languages, linguists have to work with communities. Again, as a discipline, perhaps uh, one th something of our history uh, as a discipline of linguistics, which is just as recorders of um, uh, languages and their uh, endangered status. So let's grab the data before they go away. What this multidisciplinary volume shows us is that if you, everybody had a perspective on language. And the issue of maintaining a language is not something that only governments can do. Linguists have to work with social science and communities and theories to work together to be able to read languages social meaning. And for the discipline of linguistics, I think that the book, the fact that this wonderful seminar and then the subsequent essays that have come up have show us to us this, the diversity with which the question of language as multilingual people must be approached in multilingual societies. And therefore, in, in a, I think in a really fundamental sense, when we talk about decolonizing our discipline, it's not in the sketch grammars, it's taking the experiences of multilingual society. And looking at not only state documents, but actually what are we doing about it? And it's very clear that no one uh, discipline can do it alone. So that perhaps for the next decade, if we can push for a vision in which language is restored to its full social meaning, of course, linguists will benefit Right? because we'll be able to, uh, uh, people will speak their language, but we must plan languages in their multilingual uh, ecology. And that this point is made repeatedly, but sometimes the pyramid takes over and we only see the pyramid. So thank you very much for a very enjoyable volume um, of Professor Rabbi, uh, Professor Batsayan, no, Dr. Batsayan, and um, my congratulations to all the writers. I'm sorry that I could not do justice in my comments to each of your papers, but I actually enjoyed every paper in this book. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha, for the appreciation. Okay. <laughs> I wish other scholars are also listening to you. I'm sure. Yeah, so next, Professor Sapita Parkumar, could you just comments? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sudha Gopalakrishnan, and thank you so much, IAC, as well as uh, Anvita for doing the book. And of course, uh, Kapila J's spirit somewhere must be very, very happy to see us all engaging with this book, which has come out of a lot of hard labor, but also a lot of love and passion. And every writer in the book seems to have uh, that seems to have that commitment to the idea of linguistic plurality, which I believe is um, not only the concern of the linguists, but definitely the concern of literature, which is already doing quite a lot about it. If uh, one were to look at uh, the wonderful essay also by um, uh, Mahindra Mishra on this uh, particular subject, when he talks about uh, Bhasha Swaraj, what a wonderful expression. I mean, literature is already uh, celebrating the Swaraj because literature is all about non-pretentious search for some kind of truth. And with this kind of um, a passion, whether it is a language in say Manipur, some di so-called dialect, 
or if it is some oral tradition that is being pursued by a whole um, say set of a community like the Bone community, for instance, or Veil community, they are going on. And perhaps that's where a very pertinent point comes in, that literacy, in fact, has become also a mode of oppression for language uh, um, maintenance in one sense, because literacy has meant educational policy and policy has not taken account of multilinguality in the way that it needed to have. And therefore, I think the linguists are right in pursuing this matter in a very significant way. And perhaps what Aisha said is extremely important to really look at not only those figures and charts and so on, the statistics on what languages exist and so on, of course, that is important, but what is also important is to what kind of policy is framed accordingly in the context of multilinguality. And this multilinguality on the ground that we witness comes out in literature in a very big way. And that is why when the People's Linguistic Survey of India uh, started its work, I remember I was in the initial stages involved in it. And going from place to place, um, I realized, you know, well, who says there isn't any multilinguality? Who says that we don't speak our languages? It's only the insular, very educated people who become monolingual. We have become, in fact, monolingual primarily because we are very highly um, literate, you know. So I think literacy needs to open up to other languages and therefore take account, take into account that all these languages which are in a way dying out and also it, the term that is used for this is linguistic genocide and in this um, again, if I were to look at, you know, uh, the essay, for instance, by uh, Surajit Sarkar in this volume, and he, he very beautifully picks it up and talks about orality, and he expands the whole notion of language, not only to, to the verbal language, but he also goes into the question of, say, uh, working with ceramics, working with textile weaving as a language. After all, what is language meant for? Language is meant for, in, in one sense, to basically express um, in an authentic way, to express oneself and then take into account the other in order to move from expression to communication. So it becomes a social activity. Now, if that is the case, and if, you know, if languages begin to die because of lack of, um, a lack of recognition, official recognition, then what happens? What happens is that many of these oral traditions and everything else gets marginalized. And in this marginalization of um, this entire domain of uh, what we, what Anvita very rightly put it, like, you know, in the context of imperialism, linguistic imperialism, there is a certain kind of hemorrhaging, as Jian Devi puts it, hemorrhaging of languages. And we become a sick society, you know, insular pockets which are working in a hierarch hierarchical fashion. And there is a class divide within that particular domain. And that is what I think we need to explode. We need to explore that and for, for, for that I often say one has to come come to literature for that and that is and it won't be really very far-fetched to really give the example of even the Booker Prize today see the moment Hindi a prize it price comes to Hindi, immediately there is recognition of the literature and therefore expression, literary expression, which is um, uh, found in Hindi literature. But we need to go even beyond that and look at the, say, the languages of the tribes and see how they are able to express not only themselves as individuals, but the worldview of the communities that they belong to. And that worldview is also inclusive of knowledge systems. And through the, through the elimination of the languages, slowly degeneration of the languages or lack of recognition of the languages, what happens is that there is a diminishing. And also there is not just a diminishing of the language or culture, but there is also uh, somebody, some one of the uh, essays, if I'm not mistaken, it's again probably 
um, Mohendra Kumar Mishra, who talks about sense of self-hate that develops. The self-hate that develops because of a certain complex of not belonging to the upper crust of society, which is, um, you know, kind of uh, speaking all the time in English and therefore alienating oneself from community, uh, all the communities that are working at the ground level. So, yes, English has also trans been transformed in the context of becoming one of the bhashas today in India. But that doesn't mean it should become one of the bhashas at the cost of other bhashas. Mm -hmm. And how do we therefore revitalize these languages, other bhashas, which are not just 22. We know the figures keep changing census after census, but we know that it comes, comes into hundreds, if not thousands, as the number of mother tongues that we have in this country. And each mother tongue cannot be, it has to be given its dignity, its autonomy, and not to be seen as a dialect. G.N. Devi has a wonderful passage in his, and he's philosophically dealing with the whole notion of what is a dialect and how dialect is uh, looked at. I think we need more debates in that dialects also, if a language is termed as a dialect, it cannot be dismissed as uh, not the right mode of, or the proper mode of expression. So someday just, I think this, can I, uh, it's a, uh, sorry? No, can I please intervene as a moderator? It was wonderful, yeah. such an impassioned, uh, what should I say, apology for literature and also not just of the worldview that, that represents an oral tradition and everything, you know, the go flows into what we call as, you know, language in a, with, with a capital L. Thanks so much for it. And then we'll again come back if we have time. Uh, sure, I'm sorry. I mean, I've no, no, I have not. You have not. I was just cautioning. You know, if you have something sure. else to say, please do. You want to close? No, I will wind up, yes. Uh, I'll just wind up in a sentence or two. And yeah. I just want to basically uh, talk about the existential crisis that comes up if the language is denied to oneself, the mm -hmm. language of one's being. And uh, I think that is what we are really talking about, that mm -hmm. existential crisis that we are already going through, not only as an individual, but as a nation. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, please, uh, Dr. Hassan, will you please say what you Uh, again, the you're uh, you're muted right now. You're muted right now. Thank you, Dr. Sudha Gopala Krishnaji, and I thank also the ISC for giving this opportunity to be with all of you, to be part of this wonderful panel discussion on linguistic diversity in South Asia and Southeast Asia. I must start with a confession that. I look at it as a kind of a, uh, providing a sense of compensation to me because I missed finally getting myself placed in this volume, although I was one of the participants. For some personal reasons, I could not submit my paper. So this is a good, great, at least, compensation to me. I remember way back in 1960, there was a publication by Ferguson and Gumpers and the title was Linguistic Diversity in South Asia, Studies in Regional, Social, and Functional Variation. And this book, I look as something which is a watershed in that kind of a South Asian studies and social linguistics, because it provides a continuity with that publication. At the same time, it provides a rupture to what Ferguson and Gumper's volume presented there by going beyond its uh, subtitle, which was studies in regional and social functional variation, basically to fore foreground the existence of linguistic imperialism and the power dynamics that is shared by both South and Southeast Asia. In fact, it doesn't stop there. If the collections that it has, it's a remarkable in that sense because it has expanded the territorial ambit by connecting all the nations of South and Southeast Asia in terms of presence of linguistic diversity and in its treatment of linguistic diversity as representative of the biodiversity 
which has existed and sustained the indigenous communities. And we all know that no biodiversity can sustain itself without a linguistic diversity. In fact, what is another thing that the book makes it a landmark is that it is bringing that openness and contemporaneity because it is treating language not as a differential code rather than actually use with indexicality. And if you glean through the papers, many of the papers have looked at language in terms of parole, in terms of language use, and they engage themselves not with the idea of coexistence of separate linguistic items, but in the sense of bringing the issues of identity, politics, ideology in the ambit of their presentations, that thereby bringing the notion of indexicality. And this point makes me close, bring close to the question of looking at linguistic diversity title with a, with a sense of certain criticality. Because I personally feel now that with this kind of an engagement that the book is involved in, it also makes a strong case for going beyond the linguistic diversity to talk about ethnographic diversity with a more social orientation to the study of language, since the humankind cannot be understood apart from the evolution of maintain and evolution and maintenance of ethnographic diversity. In fact, this brings me close to what Heimsian ethnographic approach talks about, where he is making a case for the speaking and communication over language. And in the entire analysis, there is a preference to the speech where the language shifts itself from the code to language use, and thus continues to focus on not just code, because code is always restrictive, code is always extractionist, and code is always exclusionary. This is not just what Heims talks about, but this is something that is being dealt with today. When we look up those studies carried out by a number of his scholars, where speech is language in which people have made investments, the social, the cultural, the political, the individual, and the emotional ones. And each aspect of that investment emerges from the papers that have been selected by the authors, by the editors of this volume. In fact, we are all familiar uh, with the notion of the discourse, but we, have, we also need to remind ourselves that it is the emergence of the idea of ethnography diversity, ethnographic diversity that persuaded scholars all over to talk about the distinction between linguistic notion of language and ethnographic notion of language. And many of the papers in this volume have touched upon these notions, perhaps maybe looking at it, not something which is consequent, which is accidental, but it has its own consequential value. I'll stop it here so that we can have floor given to others for the question answers also. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very concise, at the same time, very pertinent points that you raised. Thanks a lot. Now I think I will reserve my own questions and I'll open the floor to the people who have raised some questions. I will read them one by one. Uh, one is from um, Mr. S. Goyle, who have, uh, I'll read out his question rather comment. This is actually a comment based on my diplomatic experiences in Southeast Asia and as a former DG of IC ICCR. Professor Abhi used terms like apartheid and imperialism in the context of languages. Could someone please explain this phenomenon in Southeast Asia or in India? My own view is that script of the language can be guided by the ruler or the government, but the spoken traditions have their own energy and evolve on the basis of usage. Brahmi as, as script and Sanskrit as spoken in Southeast Asia are examples. No apartheid possible. So this is from Mr. Goel. Would you like to comment, uh, Dr. Yeah. 
May yeah. I comment on this? Yeah. Since, since he used my name. Uh, you see, uh, thank you, Dr. Mr. Goel, for raising this uh, question and issue. It's a very intense and very significant issue. Uh, you see, the linguistic apartheid is generated because we have made, we have divided our society. We have divided our society on the basis of the use of languages that the social society is using. On one hand, there are the upper class which uses English or any other dominant language of the country. And there are others who, as you said, there are several dialects which has its own energy. However, it is these what you call dialects. Actually, linguists don't uh, like the term dialect. We just say varieties of language. These varieties are dying out or being killed. The word killed can be used because it is the speakers themselves want to forget their languages. And you can see right at home in Jharkhand, most of the tribal languages, uh, especially I mean, with Kuruk, we notice that the Kuruk speakers want to forget their, their indigenous language. Either they want to learn Hindi or they want to learn English. In, which, in fact, there is an English Devi in Jharkhand, which everybody wants to uh, worship. So the what this divide of recognizing one language at judiciary level, at administrative level, and at educational level, and ignoring the others totally at these three fora, they, of course, generates a kind of a linguistic apartheid. So unless and until we recognize our unwritten languages, which are more than 800 within India, as I said, there are 3,000 across South Asia and Southeast Asia, but closer to home, there are more than seven to 800 unwritten languages. However, they are very, very rich in their indigenous knowledge, culture, art form, and Mahindra Mishra's article uh, will emote this. Not only this, he has, uh, well, while we are talking about this, I must inform that Mahindra Mishra, Kumar Mishra has introduced multilingual education in Chhattisgarh with a great success. The tribals have started coming to school. The dropout rate has gone down and some kind of dignity, honor, and pride has been imbibed in their mother tongues. So that's a very, very big achievement by, by the folklorist Mahendra Mishraji. But coming back to this linguistic apartheid question and imperialism, it definitely exists between the unwritten and the written languages. And that's what I meant when I, when I use these words. Thank you so much. Uh, since you mentioned uh, dialects, the next question is on dialects. So this is by Subrata Chakraborty. She says that dialects within a given language also unite or divide people. Is, are there any thoughts on that? So who would like to talk about dialects? Sure, I'll take, I'll, I'll take. So I, okay, okay, Asha, please go ahead. So I think we're all dying to um, trot out the Weinreich quote at this point. Uh, <laughs> so the very famous uh, um, a linguist from the 1940s uh, made this very pity and very apt comment, um, which is a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. So you're absolutely right that language, dialects can divide, but what exists as social phenomena in language are only dialects. It's which dialect that gets to be a prestigious language that is not decided by the linguistics of our event, that's by the social political configuration. So if you just went 200, 300 years ago, then the big literary, one of the big literary languages was Braj Bhashra. The other was Hindi. And now if you look at um, the situation 300 years later, so unity and division are created, I don't think, by languages or the existence of many dialects. Our consciousness of what is a dialect is also, uh, is really a reflection of who has the power. So who speaks what with whose blessing? And if that power is something which is in history, always uh, redistributed. So you'll be, you're a Bengali, I think. So you'll be surprised to know that uh, if you look at the census of India, the census of India lists a language called Hajong as a dialect of Bangla. 
Uh, I can assure you that if you were listen to speak to a Hajong speaker, you because this is a very interesting uh, language, it is. Um, it was a Tibeto-Burman language, for, so completely from a different language family, and which uh, over centuries, because the speakers shifted but didn't lose their um, uh, uh, Tibeto-Burman um, base, it's a, it, the substrate of that language is a Tibeto-Burman uh, variety on which there has been Aryanization. But officially, you are told that it is a dialect of Bangla. Every linguist will tell you that it's an independent language. So um, the divisions and the unifications are spurious. They're not based on linguistic criteria. They're based on social criteria. And the antidote to this, this sense feeling of division or the feeling of unity, I think is the same. All languages, all speech varieties are equal. That's the central tenet of linguistics. Just to add on to this, what Aisha just said to the knowledge of uh, Shubhra Chakravarti, I would like to inform her that she rightly, Aisha rightly said that this is all a politics, uh, a, I mean, a, a politics of dominance, who rules, who decides. The very good example that I can give is that the Hindi, now which is considered as Bhasha and the major language of the country, he, it is derived from Khadi Boli, the name was Boli which means dialect, and Braj Bhasha, which had very, very rich literature, has now become a dialect of Hindi. So the tables have turned, you know, so Braj Bhasha becomes a Boli now, and the Boli has become Bhasha. And there is no linguist who has done this. Linguists were not even consulted, you know, to have this kind of nomenclatures changed. That's why I was saying the language and dialect are the, only the names which are being used by the people who want to rule in certain way. Okay, Dr. Sudha, you can go. Yeah, on. thank you. That is a related question from uh, Nirbhaya Kumar. He was, he, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if any of the panelists can comment on perhaps self-imposed psychological superiority of certain languages. For example, most people learn English over their native languages. That point, if anyone wants to. Okay. If I may uh, get into this, I think it's um, uh, not really self-imposed. Really. You know, it has a lot to do with policy. It has a lot to do with the hierarchy that all of us are talking about. The, the way hierarchy is established sociologically and politically. It's most politically and then it gets into a sociology and then therefore alignments and aspirational uh, points come up when children are, uh, you know, uh, made to speak only in English, for instance, and then you belong immediately there is a class shift the moment you acquire English language and a certain accent in that language. So therefore, I don't think it is self-imposed. I, th I think it has a lot to do with the way uh, our politics have, uh, linguistics and uh, politics have functioned over the last many, many years. So, um, In fact, adding to that, uh, I would also say that this so-called self-imposed is a basically a product of your ideological construct. Because you are, you are take, there is a particular ideology that is working that makes you feel that it is superior or that makes you feel that the other one is inferior. And that is how you feel that I should give up my own language and go for this superior language. There is, there is a whole set of ideology that is working behind it. Thank you. Another one from Shweta Shukla, who's asking, uh, you talked about Bahasa Indonesia, and I can't agree more with you of what you said. Having li lived there, I realized how in around 50, 60 years, a mixed language, Bahasa Tampur, spread and became popular in, in a wide and populous country. Why do you think we did not see a similar phenomenon in India? Kaimtyaz would be happy to answer this. Yes. See, yeah. the one thing is, you press, uh, we must understand that uh, India is one country which when we, sh we should all feel proud of one fact that with one stroke of genius, we have scuttled the entire issue of national language. 
<laughs> this is this is uh, remarkable, and as a result, we cannot make a claim that there is any language, language which is a national language. So it, this this kind of a thing that that has been possible here, and this is not the case with regard to Bahasa Indonesia, because uh, we have we have at least been able to say that. Uh, all the languages that are there as part of the scheduled languages are all national languages. And we are only talking about the official status that has been conferred on some, which is there, and those are the official languages. I think I'll... If I may add here, you know, while, um, um, while it's true that we have no national language, so it's the lingua francas that stretch across huge zones of uh, India, because people will communicate whether they are speaking an official language or not. And uh, what you have in India is actually a stunning amount of, which are also considered minority languages, but they're actually spoken by huge majorities of people. So if you look at the language Sadri, which is called Nagpuriya, and there are films also made in Nagpuria, but you know, we are, nobody lists it as a language that we are supposed to be proud of, uh, which is spoken from Nagpur all the way up to Assam, it's, where it's called Sadani. So there are huge languages, there are Nagamese, there are huge number of languages in the, in, across the Hindi in the Bili belts. So there is um, all Marathi, uh, Marathi and varieties of Marathi all the way up to Karnataka. So it's a question, this is why, you know, the point that Dr. Rabbi was making that there is an apartheid, that there are languages which people have named, which people speak, which they use for inter-community um, uh, communication. But those languages don't make it into any list. And they are not written. They have they, they change from region to region. This is different from the case of Basa Indonesia, which through state power, um, if please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but through dissemination through a variety of state systems, they um, this language has gained prestige as the link language uh, across Indonesia, which is quite similar to us. We don't, but do we need one language? Do we need one language in a country with as many diverse language families as we do? It's not. People will communicate and people, but we should recognize those languages. I would like to inform and add right here because Shweta, uh, Shweta ji, you may be happy to know that India has developed a kind of a lingua franca in Hindi across the nation from Tibeto Burman area, that is meaning from the Himalayas to the way down to the Andaman Nicobar. Hindi in its non-standard form, in its non-standard form without any of these uh, trappings of the standardization is used across the country in different ways. And it has many, many varieties. So the, uh, the especially in Andaman Nicobar, it is people with pride say that we use Hindi. That Hindi is very different than the Hindi is used in Delhi or in Jharkhand or in Bihar that Sabiha Hashmi talks about in this volume or anywhere in the Dakhini, in the Dakhin in, in Hyderabad. So Hindi has emerged as a lingua franca and especially in the areas of the Himalayas, you would be happy to know that the kind of work that the Bhasa Indonesia are doing in Indonesia, Hindi is doing among the various tribes because before the advent of Hindi, no tribe could understand any other tribe. The languages there are mutually unintelligible. After the advent of common Hindi or a lingua franca Hindi, there have been intermarriages, there have been so religious congregation in Hindi. But that Hindi, if you listen to, you may laugh at. But it is a Hindi and it's another version of Hindi. So he, people do develop a common language to communicate across. Yeah. So there is another question from Shubha Bhattacharya who talks about the partition of India has resulted in the loss of some Punjabi dialects that were spoken only in parts of Punjab that are now in Pakistan. It results in feeling of uprootedness of the migrant population in a very profound manner. 
Are there any studies to record the loss of such dialects and the effect of such loss on the affected populations? I don't think Can I just uh, say one statement as a non-linguist, because I feel quite lonesome here being only a literature person and not a <laughs> linguist. However, I do want to stress on the point that, um, you know, the, the these dialects, call them varieties, dialects, whatever. But the point is that if you really start getting into the stories that are told, which come across from across the borders, from every side, and I don't know whether to call them, a, you know, refer to them as a variety of Urdu or a variety of Hindi or a variety of Punjabi because it's a certain kind of Hindustani which you know flowers out in a, in a very beautiful way in storytelling. So I think that's one way of you know, these collections that come out from across the borders. If you were to look at them without going through the translation, just in maybe Devnagdi script, if they were to be turned into Devnagdi script, there would be an immediate deep glimpse into the connections that we have with that part of the world. Sukhrita, you didn't have to feel bad that you're the only literary person in this <laughs> whole group, because that one thing I am also there. Secondly, um, the, the, the next question is about you, or rather comment. Professor Sukhrita's very, uh, Sukhrita very rightly spoke of the need to provide dignity and autonomy to languages especially the ones at the verge of near extinction. The language of Indus Valley civilization, Sindhi suffered a blow in India as most Sindhis left lock, stock and barrel at the time of partition. As they did not get a piece of land, most scattered in various parts of the country, which further damaged the cause. Is there any empirical data available in the state of Sindhi language, on the state on the state of Sindhi language in India, and this is from Jayashree Jethwani. I could quickly respond uh, to this. Well, Sindhi is one of the scheduled languages, so actually you have um, information about how many speakers of Sindhi there are in um, uh, India. Every ten years, the census drops it out. But census data always has to be approached with caution because it's a matter of language <coughs> loyalty. So people give the return, not based on their real linguistic knowledge, but what loyalty they have to that Sindhi identity. So you could get information from them. But there's also Sindhi writing. But I would say that this is a language which is because precisely for the reasons that you said, uh, and it's assimilation to majority languages, that this is a language that is not healthy um, in the um, current state. It, it's not healthy, it, despite being a scheduled language. Again, no, the reason very, the, you know, reasons are the yes. same because orally it's not transmitted across generations. Yes, same thing. Though you see, even Sahitya Academy gives a word in Sindhi every year. So it is recognized at the literature level also. But all those recognitions uh, are good for nothing unless people speak the language at home. But fortunately, yeah. Sindhi is spoken and uh, it is a flourishing language in Pakistan. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, there are translations of Sindhi stories into English that I have read. So I, uh, one can make out that younger writers are also writing in Sindhi. Mm -hmm. I think what you need is a policy initiative that will re create the use of the language as a spoken language, as something yeah. um, that people will want some domain of use. Mm. And mm. that is something which so the language domains have been utterly taken over whatever dominant language that yeah. is spoken and intergenerational transfers over. Another thing is that Sindhi yeah. in Pakistan is with the Persian Arabic script. Yes. Yes. And, that has yes. Been, and that's the reason why it is still being, it's still flourishing there. Right. This is not the case in case of uh, India. Yeah. We have some more questions. And one of them is actually a very good comment from Mahendra Mishra. He says that, I consider if the unwritten languages are introduced in schools, language revitalization can be possible through a strong community initiative. I am thankful to all the panelists to nourish minority languages through this book. Grateful to you all. I felt honored for my hard work. <laughs> well, we learned a lot from him. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'm sure he's listening to that. So the next one is from Sahna Mehra. What will be the impact of Hindi imposition in India? Very broad subject. Whoever wants to take it. Well, I think one impact perhaps one is already seeing, but does one, you know, so the idea that all communities are monolingual, that they uh, even very small languages, that they do not want to learn Hindi, that they do not, I think that that kind of, um, I think colonial understanding has to change, just like that, whether they want to learn English or not. I think that in India, if we turn change to a multilingual mode of thinking, then like, you know, so those of you in, uh, who have ever got onto a DTC bus, and, you know, there are three people on the seat, and there will always be some auntie who will come and tell you, shift over, and they'll put the children and there's some auntie. This is the model by which we must look at how Indians look at, in multilingual societies, look at languages. So that there is always space for another language. So, but if Hindi imposition means that your other language will not get a script, or English imposition or whatever, regional language imposition. If you will not get a script, you cannot use this language. You will be considered strange if you speak it. Right? That there is no recognition of your community in your school, then a language gets imposed. So I don't believe that you know, there is this anathema to people learning another language because we are used to it. This is how, um, we we live in India, so I think um, the impact certainly we know that in um, um, in the hills in Hima, in not Himachal but in Kumau, um, there are a number of languages have become displaced. They were small languages, numerically small, but they um, their domain shrunk because they weren't spoken. And as Mahinderji said, if you took that unwritten language and you gave it a script. I mean, the Soviet Union by 1925 had given all its languages a script. And a hundred years after um, that 1925, we have not given Indian languages a script. I think maybe 70 languages are written. So that is the crisis before us. I think that demonizing one language or the other, usually it is, I'm sorry, this is a favorite topic of mine, but very quickly, that, uh, uh, you know, it's the big regional languages that fight in the imposition. The smaller languages just cave in. And that parents who can, children, parents of children who cannot afford uh, education, then just choose a Hindi or an English education because there is no education available in their languages. So it's easily reversed. But as Mahindraji says, and as the evidence from Indonesia says, plan it according to the community and involve the community. So the next question is from Pallav Vishnu. We have three, four questions more, so I would request everybody to be geared to that. Can we really use folklore to interpret the cultural identity of a language and dialect to clear the difference between them? Uh, the, interpret the cultural identity of a language and dialect to clear the difference between them. Could you please highlight certain examples, Madam? I think it means, I mean, how, how language uh, and uh, 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 language as a more wider phenomenon and dialect as a subsect of it, something like that. So is that is there a difference between them and how do how does it impact? So that that's a question. Uh, if I understood him right, I'm not sure. You see, in folklore, uh, whether it is of dance or music or tell, st telling a story or mythological stories, see, many of the language there is an input of several languages, varieties of languages, and uh, for example, how the characters are speaking. So when you hear a particular uh, uh, epic also, which goes on overnight, let's, let's say in, in Chhattisgarh, uh, there was a Halbi epic I was listening to, and I realized there is a lot of Hindi in it, because depending upon how the speakers are 
the reacting to it. So folklore definitely gives ample avenues of all kinds of characters which exist in your life surrounding you to emote in their respective languages or dialects or varieties and so on and so forth. Folklore is a very good representation of society. So yes, these are represented in folklore. And I, I personally think that the oral tradition, including the folklore, should be part and parcel of school education. There can be a period devoted to the indigenous folklore uh, so, you know, studies, which belong to that same community that the students are coming from. And this way, we will enliven our language, sustain our language, as well as give a lot of information about the indigenous communities. And if I may add, you know, it also acknowledges multilinguality because folklore very easily is inclusive of other languages that exist around that. There is no notion of what we call pure Hindi or pure, yeah. which is always yes. an imposition from the outside. So I think it's a very good idea to have folklore mainstreamed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, since we have overstepped time, I would request everybody to be a little bit more briefer about comments and also even the questions. I think the questions are also very long to grapple with, you know. So, so on that point, with that point, I'm now talk, uh, going to Ashok Atri, who is asking a question. Have you looked at successful examples of preservation of languages elsewhere? Switzerland keeps high German and local German dialects. Zambia teaches every child English and tribal other, uh, other tribal tongue. There is no friction and dialects are preserved. So is there a way, can, can one learn from this kind of bilingual or multilingual scenario? So, you know, in principle, the three language formula was intended to do this kind of uh, work, but uh, um, this, can't go into any details about it at this point, but that's where it, it didn't work. But in principle, we have architectures that will enable us to do it, uh, except that we don't have, I mean, relating to the next question, we don't have a policy on how it is to be done. And for such a big country, the delivery has to be the uniformity is what is sought. But we have MLE in, in place. That's also... Yes, in a few places. So that... Yes. Yeah, not, not everywhere, but in some places. Yes. Okay. There are two more questions. One is Anita Nagpal. Why is it that we really have no language policy which keeps in mind the pedagogical implications of language in school education? of how learners make sense of the world around them. Decisions are taken politically or through administrative considerations. It's more like... I mean, I, think, I could say, I'll be very brief. You guys can answer this, but we it's, agree it's, with what she says. Yeah. <laughs> it's good that we don't have a, a language policy. At least. Of course, we have a posture of policy, but no language policy as such. And uh, uh, the way the policy is being imposed by the non-linguist people, I think I personally feel that it's good that there's no policy also. Because <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very lighthearted actor, right? So because if you don't, I mean, so the big problem <laughs> is yeah. from the, um, um, uh, the fact that the constitution guarantees uh, education in the mother tongue. And because there is this mapping between one person, one, um, uh, one community, one language, but uh, the state can't possibly deliver in 1652. That's the reason why we have no policy. But if we were to see individuals as multilingual, then of course the scenario would change, but that means you would have to find out about the multilingual ecologies that people live in. And that also the state has, done. so it's such a shame, I think, that we have no language policy, but as Iritya is saying that at this point, it seems a little better that we don't have a language policy because it would be quite frightening if we did. <laughs> the last question is from Joya Roy. Um, she's saying, in the 90s, we uh, worked in Adivasi coal mining areas with literacy and preschool interventions for children. Dr. Daswani of UNESCO told us about primers in all tribal languages that have been made 
but that were locked up and not used because school teachers are an important political category among government servants and lalu yadav didn't want to hire new tribal teachers though the nep of that time prescribed preschool learning in mother tongues oh that's very unfortunate <laughs> <laughs> no but i think uh, there was no very real i mean uh, uh, question about state policy as such and also nep these things were not discussed but i i suppose we will have to postpone that to another session because we have crossed the time leaps and bounds and leaps and bounds and then i think this time to wind up it was a fascinating discussion very wide ranging many many themes came up each of which could have been elaborated and i thank each and every one of you thank primus books for bringing out such a wonderful volume and also to the editor and everybody who have listened to it thank you so much thank you very thank much you. thank, thank you, you very much thank you very much